Paul, for that uh, wonderful intro. Um, so I've been uh, asked to speak today a little bit about uh, the design challenges uh, that uh, arise with the circular economy. And it struck me that actually we're probably asking the wrong questions. So I, uh, I live down in Kent with my family and we are attempting to build our own home on a plot of land that we own. The site has not without its uh, problems. Um, the trees, access difficulties, existing buildings on site and bolshy neighbours. So I had a meeting with the architect last night and we went through the fourth iteration of the design brief. So he's starting to get a little bit frustrated with us. But this iteration of the brief is the key part of the process. And when we start to think about the circular economy, we're actually asking our designers the wrong questions. Companies who are engaging designers for project, product design often don't understand the potential that a shift in the way that they sell and market products to their customers could achieve. And that, of course, will have implications for the designers who are working on the problems that are set by their clients. Um, I remember speaking to uh, uh, a friend, uh, uh, Matt Laws, at uh, the Agency of Design. Some of you may have uh, come across Matt. Um, he said, well, when I was a student, you know, I used to set us uh, tasks at college you know, to design objects and it was really difficult to think of an object that hadn't been designed hadn't already had everything thought about um, and then he said well, and then I learnt about the circular economy and then suddenly I realised everything needed redesigning and I think that's we're at the very beginning of that pathway at the moment so um, we've done a lot of work at Accenture around the circular economy and what it means, and we've written a book called Waste to Wealth, which sets out the five business models, the five capabilities, and the ten technologies which can unlock uh, the circular advantage. And we believe that the circular economy could lead to a four and a half trillion uplift in global GDP by 2030. So this is an area that organizations, companies, governments are currently uh, going to lose out on because of the inefficient way in which they use materials. And you also notice here on, on the right hand side that there is a, up to seven times greater value opportunity from selling products that have higher utility during their lifetime than thinking about a product that has a single, single life. Where do I need to point this? Okay, there we go. So, um, So those five business models. Um, and this is the very nub of why I think we're asking the wrong questions. The clients that we're speaking to need to think about the way that they can reconfigure their products and services to move from thinking about the uh, way that they can generate money and revenue from the manufacturing through to the sales phase and think actually about the revenues that they can achieve during the life cycle phase. And to do this, I think they need to think about five circular economy business models. Firstly, circular supply chain. Thinking about how they can substitute materials that have a single use for biodegradable or highly recyclable materials that can be infinitely looped. Recovery and recycling, 
Absolutely. Recovery and recycling capabilities plays an important part of this and is one of the really important business models of the circular economy. And it's probably the one that we're most familiar with. On the top right there, the sharing platform. Many of us have come across you know, um, examples of the sharing platform and have used Airbnb and Uber. Examples of how to share resources and how to share and maximize the utility of the products that we use uh, are increasing. Product as a service. How do we move from selling a product to actually selling the utility that that product provides. So rather than selling lighting, rather than selling a light bulb, sell light per lumens, as Philips is doing. Rather than selling uh, a car, sell the mobility service that the car provides. And increasingly, organizations are thinking about how they can move their products to services. And then product life extension. How can we extend the current life of the products that we have in the market? Make them good for not just one use phase, but two, three, four, five use phases. And we see examples of organizations doing that, notably uh, Caterpillar, who remanufacture the heavy plant that their customers use, and in fact, their CAT remanufacture division is one of the most profitable in the, in the group. So we look at these five business models, and we're starting then to change the question that we're going to be asking of our designers. We're starting to change the question around from, away from, how can I make a product most cheaply and efficiently and sell it into the market as quickly as possible and make my money at that point and never see that product again, to moving to thinking about how we can use these business models to generate revenue during the life cycle of the product. And I think this is important. I think it's important because it takes us away from thinking about waste in a very one-dimensional way. And the way that I like to talk about waste to people is across four dimensions. Yeah, we, we're very familiar with the way of the trash that ends up in the trash can, some of which is recovered and recycled, some of which isn't and is lost for useful use. But there are other types of wastage as well. The second type of wastage is using materials such as fossil fuels, that are used once and aren't regenerative. Then on the demand side, there are two further types of waste. Wasted capacities and wasted life cycles. So I'll illustrate those a little bit more. Who came to the RSA today by car? Quick show of hands. Who drove here? Fantastic. That means all of you sitting here who have got cars sitting at home, depreciating slowly on your driveways, are really losing quite a lot of money every minute that you sit here. And in fact, if we think about the automobile, the automobile is an absurd waste of utility. The average utility of a car in, a UK, in the UK is around 8%. So we're using the car, we're actually driving our car for about 8% uh, of the time. The rest of the time, the 92%, it's not doing anything. It's sitting, depreciating slowly. But then it gets worse. Of that 8%, about 5% of that is usefully conveying us from A to B, and 3% is sitting in traffic or finding a car parking space. So suddenly we're down to actually 5% of utility of owning an automobile. And then if you think that the average occupancy of an automobile in the UK is about 30%, so 
suddenly that 5% figure shrinks to about 1.5%. So out of all the time that we own our car for, it's actually only being useful for 1.5% of the time. Absurd waste of resources. These business models are a way of kind of reframing the way that we think about the problem to think and spur us to design products that have better, useful lives, higher capacities, and are used for, uh, made from recyclable and renewable materials. Just to illustrate those business models a little bit further, I mean, we've done a lot of work with the World Economic Forum in our research for the book looking at over 500 examples of um, circular economy businesses. Um, and we did about 50 executive interviews to kind of flesh those out a little bit further. And so in terms of kind of taking the temperature of who's doing what in the circular economy, you know, we've got a pretty good view of um, some of the great stuff that's going on and some of the stuff which is beginning to scale. Um, I'm going to call these out because they're kind of relevant to, to, to plastics, but obviously there are examples of all these business models across many different sectors, uh, from both large organisations and uh, startup entrepreneurs, and uh, you know sometimes stuff in the middle as well. Um, first quick example: this is uh, New Light Technologies. Some of you may have heard of their product called Air Carbon, which extracts carbon uh, from carbon-rich exhaust gases from, uh, uh, from, from power stations or other industrial processes um, and creates um, uh, carbon-based polymers, which can be formed into their air carbon plastic. Um, they, so, so, okay, that technology is pretty, pretty interesting, but the real interesting thing about New Light is that they've managed to make it cost-effective and it can undercut the cost of uh, other types of recycled plastic. So we're now seeing that they've been uh, able to sign commercial deals with IKEA and Dell for the manufacture of furniture and computer casings, respectively. So that's a great example of that circular supplies business model. Um, Mercedes-Benz. They've started to introduce 3D printing for their component inventory. So they now have around 100,000 plastic spares, um, which are 3D printed local to demand. So they're no longer shipping uh, uh, parts from where they're manufactured in Germany. Uh, dealers are no longer holding vast inventories of uh, uh, components, um, the designs are held and they're printed off according to demand. Um, you know, uh, an, a great example of how changing a business model around uh, can actually reveal a higher utility for plastics than could otherwise be achieved. Um, another example, um, kind of the, uh, the, the uh, sharing model. Uh, this is uh, CHEP, Chep Plastics. They pool plastic pallets, uh, primarily in the US. Um, customers uh, pay a service fee to tap into that pool. So the plastic pallets are used uh, multiple times um, in many different locations. I think um, Chep now have 420,000 customers in the US using the service. Um, and they appreciate the service because they can get the pallets where they need them to be. And from an environmental perspective, the impact of one of these pallets is about 18 times less than a comparable uh, low usage wooden pallet. We've spoken about Dell. Um, yeah, they're using new light carbon in some of their products as well. Um, they're also great at recycling plastics. Um, taking it as far as they can, pr uh, computer plastics are notoriously difficult to recycle. Um, and um, 
Dell are one of the first manufacturers to be able to take waste streams not only from their own Dell waste but uh, from other manufacturers as well um, and have uh, I think in the, in the last year uh, managed to uh, reca reclaim and remanufacture nearly uh, a million tons of plastic for uh, reconfiguration into machines. Um, and then finally, a product as a service example. Um, a lot of us are already familiar with the example of the carpet manufacturers who are able to uh, remanufacture carpet um, and uh, reclaim the nylon fibers. This is an illustration, though, of the product as a service business model. Um, Desso and Interface have um, uh, experimented with this that rather than buying a 100 square meters of carpet you, for your office premises, you buy the service of the carpet. You uh, will pay a uh, leasing fee, um, which uh, will then have uh, the manufacturer come and replace and maintain the carpet over the term of that lease agreement, and at the end of the lease agreement, take the carpet away and repurpose it for another customer. So what I've tried to illustrate there, and hopefully you're already starting to kind of join the dots in your mind, is that if we're starting to think about these new ways of doing business, that's a new brief for the designer. You're starting to think about um, some of the things that were mentioned earlier this morning, about designing for longevity, um, designing for, uh, 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 for recyclability. Um, but it's a conversation that probably, as a designer, you can't have yourself. It's a conversation that really requires you to engage with other colleagues in your business to, A, educate them around the circular economy agenda and the opportunity space that that might present. Um, and then, secondly, um, develop the product strategy that will enable your new, more circular designs to be rolled out into the marketplace. And that's not without its challenges. You know, I recognize very intimately that there are a number of different stakeholder groups that have got a finger in this circular economy pie. Um, and when we're talking about a transformation of a business model, the chief strategy officer and the chief executive officer will be involved because they will want to make sure that the company is well positioned for the future and its strategic positioning against competitors is solid. The chief supply chain officer will be saying, what do you mean? How can I possibly secure enough recycled plastic from New Light or whoever it may be, you know, when last year they only produced 100,000 tonnes of the stuff. Um, the chief operation officer will be thinking about how the efficiency of manufacturing processes can be maintained and won't want to entertain any complexity that your newfangled circular manufacturing ideas will uh, uh, entail. Um, and the sales director will be thinking, how can I possibly sell this stuff? You must be joking. Nobody wants a used product. Everybody wants a new one. So it's, a, it's an argument that starts at the very top. And I think as designers, we've got to be aware of that. We're not going to be able to change the world or change the business models that change the brief I think better said, we're not going to be able to change the brief that the CEO is giving us without educating the whole business. To transform our linear business into a circular one. I can see the opportunity uh, area for, for us. But what does that mean then? <coughs> it means we've got to get a whole lot better at innovation and product development. So go back Redouble your efforts, double the size of your team, and let's develop a product that can be designed for many life cycles rather than a single life cycle. What does it mean for sourcing and manufacturing? Rather than having a globally homogenous supply chain where perhaps we have one supplier producing 
our entire material requirement for a particular product? What does it mean to actually move to a more disparate sourcing model where we've got local providers providing smaller quantities of material, perhaps at different quality standards? In terms of sales and product use, are we set up in our organization to deal with customers when they come back to us with questions and queries uh, during, the, uh, s during the use phase? If we're moving to offering services, we've got to set our business up to give customer care during that life cycle phase, that elongated life cycle phase, recognizing that every touch point with our customer is a potential new revenue opportunity. And then finally, we've got to change our mindset about our return chains, and we've got to develop capability about those. Rather than shoving our products out of the door to a retailer and hoping they never come back, we actually want them to come back because they're the resources that we can then remarket and resell. So what does that mean for that capability? Many businesses don't have this. We've got to skill up on our return chains. And obviously asking a guy from Accenture to come along, it wouldn't be a complete presentation without the technology implications for the circular economy. Um, and they broadly fall into three different buckets. And I think the things that, um, again, as, as designers, we think how these technologies will uh, be enablers to our circular economy business models and circular economy designs. Firstly, the digital models. You know, we, we're, we're all kind of familiar and comfortable with booking a taxi on our phones and uh, obviously using Airbnb over the internet. But, you know, those digital models have been enormous enablers to those uh, sharing services. But think about what can be achieved with machine-to-machine uh, -machine technology and analytics as well as that. Thinking about entirely new ways of understanding customer usage patterns for our products and services. Um, then, of course, we've got the engineering technologies. Um, thinking about advanced recycling technologies and the track and trace return systems which enable those uh, return flows to happen and I've already mentioned 3D printing. And then somewhere in between there's the kind of the hybrid, the hybrid technologies um, which um, bring together those, those digital and engineering spheres, um, the modular design technologies and the life and material sciences. So I'm going to leave you with five things that you probably need to think about to get circular moving in your organization. Firstly, think about the business models. Think about what your circular economy strategy could be. And think about what the new business models in your organization would look like and how you could position your new business concept in the value chain to drive revenue. Hopefully, you know, you'll come up with a new Airbnb or the new Uber, um, but thinking about driving revenue from usage rather than from manufacturing sale is the very first step. Secondly, and this is something that I think, you know, as designers, we're good at is collaborating. Of the organizations that we've seen in the research, most of them, I would say, I would need to do a formal analysis on that, but my uh, instinct is most of them aren't doing it alone. Most of them have formed an ecosystem of partners throughout their value chain who can collaboratively work to solve a problem. So Jaguar Land Rover and Novellis on aluminium recycling. So the closing the loop on, on aluminium in the uh, vehicle manufacturing process has been a real kind of standout example in the UK um, for this. Um, and again, from the automotive sector, you know, Ford teaming up with Heinz to experiment with 
uh, of plastics from food waste. Um, so collaborate. And thirdly, and I think this is, this is kind of a real mindset changer. And I know it's kind of part of the existing marketing mantra, but I think it's never been more true than with the circular economy. Think about what your customer really wants. Put them at the center of your thinking. Your customer actually doesn't want to be working out how to recycle the packaging. They're just interested in eating the product. Your customer isn't really interested in the pain of um, perhaps um, you know, choosing a product and then, uh, uh, and then worrying about its maintenance and then eventual disposal. They just want to use the product. So what are the essential What's the essence of your product and service that the customer is actually buying? Is it mobility in the case of the automobile, automobile manufacturers? You know, we've seen uh, you know, the, the automotive manufacturers move into this space. Um, is it buying lighting as a service, as we've seen from Philips? Is it buying carpet as a service? So put the customer at the center of the thinking and think about what their real needs are. Fourthly, think about combining those circular business models. We've seen most economic benefits being driven from businesses who don't just stop at doing one thing, but actually uh, uh, stack it onto other uh, business models. So they don't just stop at being excellent at recycling. They think about what that means for the design phase, what that means for the product offering phase during the servicing. And so in, this is an example, again, from, from the automotive sector. Um, by stacking the three business models there, if that was done across the automotive sector, we think there would be, on average, a 14% cost reduction for the sector. So that's the kind of the, the cost benefit. But then on the revenue benefit side, we think that actually by moving into the circular economy space, there could be up to a 600 billion benefit for the whole industry by 2030. So you're reducing costs and boosting revenue. And then I think this has been said before, finally, um, start small and join the dots. Um, start, you know, start with the, 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 the pilot, the design. The, the initial thinking, don't be afraid, afraid to fail. It'll have low commercial value and you'll start to butt up against other people in your organization who, who aren't on the, uh, on the same wavelength. Then you'll start to join up different pools of activity, different good ideas, start to resolve some of the conflicts of interest that will arise. Um, and then build that out into a full life cycle offer where you're building a new culture for your business and a range of new offerings that are revenue generating. So they're the five business models, the 10 enabling technologies and the five capability shifts of the circular economy. And I think I'd like to just, just to wrap up by drawing your attention to the, the, the freeze around the building, which I was pondering during the coffee break. It, this, this freeze is entitled The Progress of Human Knowledge, and it starts over here with um, creation and humankind climbing out of the prim primordial slime through to um, classical philosophy uh, and then the Enlightenment, and finally over here, the, the foundation of the RSA as the pinnacle of um, human achievement in 1777. Now, it's a shame there's not a whole lot more blank panels here because I think there's a whole lot more story that we haven't, you know, that wasn't considered in 1777 and we're just at the very outset of our journey on the circular economy and there's a, a lot more of this freeze to be painted before I think we can call ourselves knowledgeable. So I'll leave that with you. Thank you very much indeed. been a pleasure speaking to you. Thanks. Thank you. Does anyone have a burning question? Otherwise, oh, Quentin, you'll be here at lunch. Sorry, I any, any burning questions? Here's one. 
I, I really like what Accenture is actually doing at a global scale. Um, Accenture India is implementing a hundred million dollar project in my state in Meghalaya to upgrade 117 schools in Meghalaya f f with an ADB loan f through the government of India. But they've also looked at actually the design of these schools and how to engage the teachers and the students in harvesting water from the roofs, in the toilets, in these schools, because the, most of the schools are in the remote areas, and how to engage these young citizens in the whole um, ecological balance of what they do to the soil, how they harvest the rainwater, because you need to catch them young. Therefore, the early childhood uh, education is very important. By the time you're a teenager, it's hard to sculpt you to change. So what do you think of that? Because that's happening in the developing world. Um, most of these events should be taking the countries where the dump from the major cities is going because they're so poor, like little children in Africa picking up electronic waste and all the toxics released. They don't know, but they're so poor. So it's nice to preach to the converted, but I think we need to go to the battleground where the battles need to be fought. And I'm glad that Accenture is doing this, but we need a whole, we need foot soldiers on the ground. How do you mobilize that from just making profits for companies? Yeah, 100% agree. I think that's a fantastic example that, you know, you're talking about a systems change there that's not just focused on one part of the, uh, you know, one, one part of the process. And somebody's obviously kind of started to think about all the implications. T t two points. Um, there's a fantastic exa example of um, sustainable construction. BAM have put it up outside the, um, I think it's the design center in Islington. Um, a great example of sustainable construction and circular construction if you're interested in that this week. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I think it's important not to confuse circular economy with sustainability. Um, I think they are two very different things. Sometimes they're the same thing, but sometimes they're not. Um, an example of that is a, you know, perhaps a fibre or a plastic which can be uh, completely regenerated, um, but perhaps use um, a high energy content um, uh, versus a, 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 a recyclable fibre which can be manufactured avoiding um, other externalities. So um, Kralar is a fibre that's been developed and rather than using the 20 to 30,000 litres of water per kilogram that a typical kilo of cotton would use during the manufacture, Kralar uses um, about 7, 70 or so litres. So, you know, an order of magnitude less. And that's kind of innovation that is not only circular, but has great sustainability impacts as well. And I think we just you know, have to have that in our minds when we're evaluating solutions as well. I think we've, uh, we've got to keep moving here. So we've got a, a panel coming up. So thank you very much, Quentin. You'll be around at lunch, hopefully.